You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we're building a franchise on an Anderson Foundation in Fab Facts. We're on the hunt for a traitor in the randomizer. And the man with the score, George Morton, is back. Cool. Conduct him this way for Pod 214. I see what you did there at the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Yep. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Well, hello now, there. No, 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 no. Before you even start, Jamie, Jamie Anderson, oh, son of Jerry started. Anderson, and co-host of the Jerry started. Anderson podcast. No, no, before you I... go any further, have you winded yourself before we started? <laughs> have you got rid of all your excess gas? I, hmm? mm. I mean, I... Because the, the eagle-eared amongst you might have heard in last week's <laughs> podcast there was a section where I was uh, h- uh, holding forth on some subject or other. Gambling totally interrupted. Yeah, well, not even interrupted. You just you just went for it, didn't you? Big old belch, halfway through a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember it happening, you see. Mm. I, I feel like that must have been some other sound or a really? dog or something in the really? background. I mm. don't remember belching. But anyway, mm. um, uh, Editor right. Laura, if you do hear any future little bouts of flatulence please do mute my microphone when you hear those thank you very much yeah uh, sorry yeah, for best. anyone whose ears uh, i offended there uh, anyway mm. the person dropping me in it over there is richard james co-host yes. of the Jerry Anderson podcast star of stage screen audio uh-huh. all sorts of stuff played yeah. officer hubble orin in space precinct and many other things besides uh, jeremy mm. vile in terror hawks for example oh, yeah yeah, yeah, it was fun. See, there's loads of stuff you've done, and and also mm. various characters in uh, First Action Bureau. Yeah, that was also fun. Yeah, so you've you've done a load of stuff, and, I've done and all right, still mate. 213 episodes of the Jerry Anderson podcast, as I have also. <sighs> is that what it is? Done. Wow. Mm. Yeah, great. It's pretty, pretty, pretty fun. Uh, anyway, over there also, we're joined by the oh, marvelous yeah. Chris Randommeister Dale. There he is. And today, Chris yep. has got his tool out. He has. Uh, he is chisel and his hammer, and he's creating. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know what it is yet, what? but he's doing an ice sculpture of some sort. Yeah. It looks yeah. a bit it's amorphous a, right now. I've got to be honest. Yes, I think I can see a nose, and I don't know. He's had a kind of a, a brow and the beginnings of an eye, perhaps. I don't know. Could you, be. Do you think so? I'm, mm. Yeah, I'm not even. I'm not sure. That could be a, an air intake. Anyway, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. when could Chris be. is done with his ice sculpture later on, at the very end of this podcast, he'll be joining us for the randomizer, which is where he has a, a device which is called, well, the randomizer. And Chris mm-hmm. is therefore the randomizer because he operates said mm-hmm. device to bring us a random episode of a random Jerry Anson series. Uh, and he will watch along while you listen along and say along things as and you along. listen along to those yeah. things. Now, I'm the, I'm the only bird, it turns mm. out. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. just before you talk more about what's in the podcast, because yeah. you're, you're going to do that, because you always I'm do just that. just about to. Yeah, chomping at the bit. Yeah. I uh, had a lovely um, meal, a Thai, mm. Thai come Chinese, it was a hybrid mm. meal, uh, right. with previous guest of the podcast, Chris Bowden. Did you? Yeah, we had a lovely couple of beers, and it was Did a really you? lovely catch-up. And oh. I said to Chris, I will give you a shout-out on the podcast. And he said, I'll right. bet you forget. Ah, so, there you go. here you go, Chris. Done. Here's me, Done. not forgetting. Thank you so much for a lovely meal and a lovely oh. catch-up. He's a very lovely man, is Chris. Well, and that's, that's good a, to hear. avid yes. listeners to the podcast and said lots Get of nice away. things about the podcast, including you and Chris, would you believe? So, oh, no, no, no. Thanks for that, Chris. The check's in the post. Uh, yeah. Oh, that explains it. Okay, we'll get on with with the rest of the stuff then. Yeah. What else have okay. they got to hear well, other than that? All this is coming up uh, very shortly. We've got Fab Facts, of course, Jamie's favourite part of the podcast. And you at home, I know the Podstrons love Fab Facts. Take it or leave right, it too. myself. We've got some Jerry Anderson news coming up also a little later on. And just before we hit the randomizer, we'll be having uh, Jamie along for his second part of his interview with uh, George Morton, conductor extraordinaire. Yes, indeed. Correct? 
Yeah, good. Yes, Great. you're quite right. Mm. Lovely George. Yep. He was, you know, he was a bit embarrassed, I think, by his lack of Anderson knowledge. But he needn't be because that's not why we're here. It's just no. to celebrate all things Anderson from any particular angle or genre or um, yep. uh, lens of appreciation. And right. seeing as he conducted the concert, it's all musical. No, oh, quite right too. Yeah, that's lovely. Looking forward to that. And then uh, in between, uh, above and beyond all of that, we'll be hearing from our wonderful Podstrons, of course, who've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. They've been commenting on our Facebook group, the official podcast listeners group, and they've been mm-hmm. hashtagging us Jerry Anderson uh, Podcast on Twitter, and they've been commenting on our YouTube channel as well. Now, before we go any further, we must pay tribute, Jamie, to Simon Allen, one of our very own, a very keen Podstron who unfortunately left us... Uh, in the last week or so under very sad circumstances uh, so very very sad to hear of the death of Simon Allen if you're a regular listener or frequenter of our Facebook group you'll know all about Simon and his uh, uh, hilarious puns his uh, excellent mm. emails and other messages yes, yes absolutely yeah I mean in a way it'll be quite a relief now not to read out an email and think what's that from Simon Allen <laughs> because he would very often send us cheeky little messages under different guises one memory I have of him though mm. particularly was when we met him at uh, Elstree at the ITC event. And he said there yes. were only two people in the world who he enjoyed antagonising more than you and me, Jamie. And that was Benji and Nick from the Benji and I Nick Show. I remember, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, bless yeah. him. Dear old Simon, so if you want to hang on till the very end, uh, Willow and other fellow Podstrons have put together a nice little audio file of memories and recollections and thoughts for Simon that we will play at the very end of this podcast. Quite right, too. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. But I'm sure, being the big old joker, he would not want us to be morose mm. in this no. one. So, no, heaven forbid. Uh, yeah, so memory to be shared at the end. But in the meantime, we shall proceed, as usual, uh, heads held high, and I'm sure a few bad jokes along the way in Simon's yeah. honour, probably. And we can't help yeah. it, can we? Uh, no. But let's get on with it, shall we? Shall we do Fab Facts? Do you know, I'm feeling up for it this week. <laughs> Makes a change. Here we go, then. Now. Time for this week's Fab Facts. Yes, Fab Facts. Uh, now, Potstron, yep. moments from now, Richard will be shouting Fab, not randomly, yeah. no, but no, in no. response to me flicking through the pages of a book. That book yeah. is the book of Fab Facts. And by mm-hmm. shouting Fab, he'll stop me on a random page. And yes. hopefully there we will happen upon a Fab Fact. Yeah. Did a slight interpolation of things there. Did you, did yes, you like, I like it? it? Yes, yeah, yeah. you gave us a little yeah. clue of everything that's about to happen. Like a little bit, preview. Bit of, but a bit of variety, because I started with yeah. your fab, you see. So, so I see, why, yeah, why is he going to shout fab? I was, mm, no, I, I don't think anyone's really following it that closely, trying to, Jamie. It's trying to keep it, you know, spice no, things up a bit. Just, just, just get on with it, yeah. Okay, right, here we go with the book then. <sighs> Ready? Mm, yep. Off we go. Fab! No, How did you almost get to the end there? No, I didn't. I slowed down on the flicking because I thought you were going to be a naughty boy and, uh, oh. uh, and keep me waiting, and I was right. Mm. Anyway, here's your reward for oh, trying to con me uh, in my fab fact selection. Richard James. Yes, Jamie Anderson. I imagine that you may well have heard of a series from the 1960s called Star Trek. Star Trek. Did it amount to much? Did it come to anything? Not really sure, mm, but I'm, I'm yeah. hoping you've heard of it, perhaps. I'm familiar with it, certainly, yes. Okay, yeah. well, you might have heard of it, and uh, we occasionally mention it on this podcast, particularly when there's an Anderson connection. Mm. Uh, well, today we've got one of them, and it's extremely tenuous. Oh, great, that's my <laughs> favourite. I knew I was going to love it. The best kind of fab facts are the tenuous yeah. ones. So yeah. uh, the special effects of Star Trek sometimes compare a bit unfavourably to those of the Anderson shows. I don't think that's unfair to say. After all, mm. Derek Meddings and his whole team were striving for rather cinematic standards. Without the benefit of Lou Grade's unlimited support, the competition sometimes seemed like it was just trying to get done on time and on budget, which is, mm. you know, yeah. part of the job. Absolutely. But you might be forgiven for thinking that the effects of Star Trek were produced by Jerry and Sylvia Anderson because the company that did produce them was called Anderson and Co. Was it now? <laughs> well, well, yeah, yes, it was. Ah. Also known as the Howard Anderson Company, Anderson and Co. was founded in 1927, so two years before Dad was born. Uh, in the 19... 19- very good. Look at you being Sorry. very on slash off brand. Go on. Uh, 
Now, in the 1960s, they were being run by two of uh, Howard's kids, Daryl and Howard Jr. Uh Uh-huh. They were a relatively small operation and struggled to keep up with the workload on Star Trek, which was very ambitious, uh, as you can imagine. Yeah. Now, despite the names, the Howard Anderson Company is in no way connected to Jerry Anderson. Uh, right. Of course, as those of you who know have watched the documentary in particular, um, Anderson was adopted as a new name from Abrahams in order to escape the anti-Semitism of the 1940s. It's just one of those weird coincidences. Even more weirdness followed as the Andersons, that's Howard's Andersons, not Dad's Andersons, continued yes. to work in various forms until 2015. Some of the productions they were involved in included a sci-fi film called Class of 1999. Right. And yeah. some film some people may have heard of called Team America. Get away. <laughs> really? Yeah, so oh. there were Andersons involved on Team America, <laughs> uh, the puppet sh- puppet film, which was not a homage, uh, certainly not by the producers to all things Anderson, but by lots of people mm-hmm. who worked on it, it, it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all this has got me thinking now, Richard. What would Star Trek have been like if Century 21 Productions had done the effects? Oh. Would you watch Star Trek in Super Marionation, for example? Oh, 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 interesting. Or would you just have enjoyed it more because it would have had bigger and better model shots and explosions? Hmm. That's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, we'll probably never know. Well, unless there's some interesting film canisters hanging around somewhere that uh, have got some unknown effect shots that Derek and team did. Uh, yeah. It's not going to be It's not going to be something we're going to see anytime soon, but we'd love to uh, hear your thoughts on a Century 21 Star Trek. Uh, you can email us at podcast at jerryanderson.com with your thoughts and ideas. So there you well, go. Well, I mean, that, that's very interesting. You know, these days, it's it's um, it's it's the done thing, isn't it, to have a musical episode of a, of a TV show or a slightly kind of off-kilter episode. Well, wouldn't it be fun for something like Strange New Worlds, the latest Star Trek series, mm. if they had a Super Marination episode? You know... It would be very strange. But was somehow and explained... quite off-brand. You know, within, yeah, but within the story of the... Well, you know... I think it would work. I can see that. <laughs> okay. Well, I look forward to seeing you submit your script for uh, <laughs> Strange New Worlds filmed in Super Marination. Good luck with <laughs> yeah. that one. Five. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's, <laughs> it would never I, I, I don't think so, but who knows. No. Uh, anyway, there you go. Mm. Super tenuous fab fact. Mm, really? Just slightly. I mean, well, yeah. So what you're saying there is that someone who shared the same surname as the surname that your father's family chose worked on Star Trek and Team America which is probably the most relevant okay. in a weird yeah. sort of a way but yeah okay yeah go on then give you that okay right well anyway that's uh, a rather tenuous end to this week's Trek tenuous fact. fact oh tenuous <laughs> track fact I was trying to prompt you with the tenuous thing you see yeah you so. were I know but I yeah I wanted to go my own way you see you, yeah, that's you good. yeah okay and I certainly you. did that's good. Uh, now, you're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Of course you are. Where else would you be? And what else would you be listening to? You can find us on whichever platform you've got downloaded onto your uh, tablet or your phone. And simply subscribe to us there as well, and you'll get notifications every time a new episode appears. Uh, you can also leave us a nice rating. And we would love it Ooh, if you'd leave us a five star rating and a few nice words, because that really does tickle the algorithms of these things. And uh, it uh, helps other people uh, find us and listen to us and maybe even enjoy us. And finally, you could copy it's the a great link as well. Phrase. Post it on all your socials and all your friends will get to hear us too. Now, I'm going to head straight on over to our rather bulging email bag. Would you like to hear a few? Uh, Well, anything that tickles the algorithm, yes, please. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ian Stevens says, Hi, chaps. Hope you're all feeling well. Uh, I posted on Facebook this morning about the trials and tribulations we're experiencing with my youngest son, Freddie, who has some ongoing health issues, namely chronic asthma and long COVID. Ah, poor Freddie. Uh, Unfortunately, this past week, he's been in hospital suffering from bronchial pneumonia, but was allowed home yesterday after four days of treatment. Now, over the last few weeks, says Ian, Freddie has shown an interest in Jerry Anderson shows, kicking off with UFO. And most recently, we've been watching Space 1999 and original Captain Scarlet. And while in hospital, he was reading the UFO comic anthology volume one, while I was reading volume two. And I also introduced him to the podcast, which he listened to via Spotify. As I said in my post, he really enjoyed listening to you all. And I just wondered if you could just say hi to him in a future podcast, as he would love that. Ah, oh, that's nice. Well, hello, Freddie. And I hope hello, you're feeling Freddy. better. 
and I hope you'll be, you'll be stronger uh, soon. Um, yes. He says, on a final note, uh, says Ian, I just want to say a huge heartfelt thank you to the Podstrons who've been so supportive during this time. Not that I would have expected anything less from this amazing, caring community. Anyway, I must go. Medicines to administer. Take care, guys. Keep up the good work. The podcast and the merchandise has certainly lifted our spirits during this tricky time. All the best, Ian Stevens. Yeah. Love it. Thanks, Ian. And... Um... Freddie, enjoy more UFO or whatever else you happen across next. Yeah. Um, now, Peg Quiller is quite a... good, I've heard. Well, <laughs> yeah, you say that. Uh, Peg Quiller <laughs> has a message here for Chris Dale. Uh, she says, oh. hi, Chris. I've just been listening to today's podcast, 212, featuring the Space 1999 episode on your randomizer. Excellent, as always. But thought you might like to know that when Victor Bergman says the line, they kill us for sport, he is actually quoting a line from King Lear. Which is, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. Very in keeping for Bergman's character, said Penn, but also for Barry Morse, who was a Shakespearean actor. Keep up the good work. Uh, P.S. to Jamie, if you worry that in the Fab Facts you always miss the early series due to the delay in Richard shouting Fab, why not turn the book upside down and start flicking from the other end? That is an excellent suggestion. Isn't it? Yeah. But I, see, I, won't, I won't be able to tell Richard that I'm doing that. So I'll have mm. to do it secretly because if I told him, yes. then he'd wait mm. until I, yes. you know, yeah. he'd, he'd call it early, wouldn't he? I yeah. would. Cra- yes, you have to think about that. You are crafty. Yeah, yeah I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, Jed Thompson, Thompson has been in touch to say hi, Richard. I love you and Jamie in the podcast. I think it's great. Well done. I have experience of Jamie's dad's work. I'm autistic, and I hope you can read out my message. Say hi to Jamie from me, and that's Jed Thompson. Hello, Jed. There you go. And he Thanks included a nice couple of pictures of uh, of you and him. Um, and one with uh, Chris Thompson as well, I think. Uh, ah. Neil Markwick says, Hi, Jamie and Richard. When I was listening to your fab fact regarding Ed Bishop and his inspiration for Ed Straker, which he took from a documentary regarding nuclear weapons, I immediately thought of World in Action, which was a hard-hitting current affairs programme produced by Granada Television between the 1960s and the 1980s. I did a bit of, bit of Googling. And the second edition of World in Action, which was first broadcast in January 1963, was called The Atomic Arms Race. Ed Bishop had worked for Granada in 1961 when he appeared in Drama 61, so maybe he was aware of the programme being produced. Possibly clutching at straws, but it's somewhere to start. Best wishes, and that's from Neil Markwick. Yeah, could be. Could be. Who knows where he picked it up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, I am investigating this because I thought it was really interesting, so I've asked our lovely friends at Network to look into their archives and see what they can find. They've had some Ah. interesting findings so far, not yet found the particular show, um, Mm. but the search continues. Yeah. And finally for now, Emma Nichols says, Hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris. I know this is early, but please can I get a birthday shout out to my sister Amy? Just like me, she's a Jerry Anderson fan and she still hasn't used her Lady Penelope cup that I got for her. I keep asking her, when are you going to use it? And her reply is, I'm going to keep it as it's special. And that's put me in my place, lol. Uh, before I forget, thank you, Jamie, for reading out my question on YouTube on the new Captain Scarlet Operation Sabre. I thought it was a great question that I asked, as no one else had come up with it. <laughs> Keep up with the good work, gentlemen, from Emma Nichols. Well, thanks, Emma, and happy birthday, however early this yes. is. Or, yes, or maybe I, late uh, now, late, I don't know. I know, yeah, that's right, yes. I, I suspect it might be a little late. But anyway, happy belated birthday to Emma. Now, if you'd like your email read out on the Jerry Anderson podcast, it's quite easy. You just send it into podcast at jerryanderson.com. I will see it with my eyes and read it out with my mouth. Very clever. You're multi-talented, yeah, aren't you? aren't I? I can do both at once, you see. I'm very impressive, gosh. Oh, yeah, multitasking, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm blown away, as always, by I your tell. incredible array of talents. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> would you uh, yeah. like to move on and get some <laughs> stuff from around the Jerry Anderson universe in the form of yeah. some Jerry Anderson news? I don't know why yes, I sounded drunk then for a moment. Jerry Anderson <laughs> news, Jerry Anderson shall we? Jerry Anderson news, we'll then. <laughs> Yes, it's the Jerry and Snoozy News. Drunky, news, drunk, drunk, news. drunk. News. <laughs> burp, 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 burp. I, I mean, uh, Newsy, Newsy, Newsy. Newsy. <laughs> so, yeah. Got there eventually. I don't need any encouragement from you for my flatulence. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, anyway, we've this got some Jerry and Snoozy News, as always, this week. Uh, and I thought I would share it with you. Oh, uh, okay. You are in the United States of America or Canada or Mexico. Uh, then we've just sent over some more cool Anderson goodies to our warehouse in Ohio. So if you would like to pick up things such as 
well, UFO comic anthology volumes one or two, or uh, mm. the Moonbase Alpha Technical Operations Manual. If you've been holding mm. off all this time. Uh, we've got badge sets and puzzles and notebooks and t-shirts and posters and all sorts. Loads yeah. more than we've had previously, so you can head across to jerryanderson.store if you are in the US uh, or the rest of North America. Mm-hmm. Those of you who've got the app, you've had your opportunity to order the Thunderbird 5 badge. We're going to give you until the end of the week before we open it up to the rest of the Anderfan world. Oh. Uh, but there aren't many left, so do pop along and get that there's a great picture on twitter where one of our lovely fans in japan has bought the full set and put all all of them onto the uh, the backer card and they oh. do look rather nifty if i do say lovely. so myself yeah. um so you can pop over to the uh, the ander app and search for thunderbird fire badge and you'll find it there i know i had a lovely uh, lovely time in belfast last weekend oh yes you did went off to see chris thompson ac mm. Mm-hmm. Andrew Clements, to those who don't know, and Connor Flanagan for the uh, launch at Forbidden Planet International Belfast of New Captain Scarlet Operation Sabre. Nice. Uh, which has been extremely well uh, received. We're very, very happy that uh, lots of people got their hands on it and it's reigniting some interest in New Captain Scarlet, which is rather lovely. In fact, I've had a couple of tweets from people saying that they are absolutely thrilled and it's enabled them to get into graphic novels and comics for the first time. So Ah. something that's very, very accessible. Uh, So the first print run is not far from selling out. So if you want to make sure you get one, uh, then pop over to the Jerry Anton store or go to the short link, which is ander.sn slash saber, A-N-D-R dot S-N slash saber. Uh, and it'll be delivered to your door. Uh, if you have to wait for the second print run, I suspect with things as they are in around the world, it's going to be another six or eight weeks from now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. grab it while you can. Now, due to popular demand, Lee Sullivan's goodies and baddies prints are now available unframed. Oh, yes. So uh, if you want to grab one of those featuring, I think, 10 of the best goodies and the best baddies from the 1960s and 1970s. I should say the worst baddies, I suppose. Um, Mm, Then uh, just pop along to the store and search for Lee Sullivan or goodies or baddies and you'll find it there. They're all hand numbered and signed by Lee himself uh, and limited to, I think, 200 worldwide. Mm. So uh, you don't want to wait there either. If you want Mm. to bargain, pop along to our eBay store as usual. Go to ander.sun slash eBay. And if you are more of a Thunderbirds fan and you're not really that bothered about the rest of the ants and stuff, which is fine, but yeah. I feel like you probably should be listening to a Thunderbirds podcast rather than the mm. Jerry Anderson podcast, but everyone's welcome here. Then we've got a special lineup of Thunderbirds only products available at a Thunderbird store, which is at thunderbird.store. Uh, uh-huh. Just seeing if people like that a little bit more than having to go yes. through the other stuff. Some people love Very all good. of it. Some people only like Thunderbirds. So yeah. There you go. There's all those things, too. There's loads more stuff happening. Fat Richard and I were having a little naughty <gasps> conversation just before this. I was say naughty. It wasn't, you know, not like that It wasn't naughty. rude. It wasn't full of no. expletives. No, no expletives at all. Just exciting no. things for yes. later this year. Yes. Uh, and lots more to come. Uh, and also, I should add, this coming Saturday uh, hmm. from the day of release, we've got a fantastic video. In fact, no, I'm, that's wrong. I'm getting confused because of time and time right. moving in one direction, yes, not two. It, it happens. Yeah. The Saturday just gone, we've ah. released uh, a video from Andrew Harmon. It's the uh, the interview that we had a couple of weeks ago, actually, on the podcast. But it's the full length video with all the uh, extra bits and pieces showing off the artwork, all about the game. So if you would like to have a watch of that and uh, enjoy learning about the game in a different way, then you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TV. Lovely. Woo. I think that's it. There's probably more, but I've forgotten it. So that's oh. the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. Slightly drunk news. I have to just point out he's not actually drunk. I was going to say, no, you know, you ast- asterisk, no actual yeah, drunk. No, it was no. just pure acting. I have you know, yeah, acting. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, I spent three Thank years you. trying to do it that well. Uh, now, Oliver Barnett is one of many Podstrons who have been uh, commenting and posting on our Facebook group. He says, I thoroughly enjoyed Operation Sabre. I grew up with New Captain Scarlet back in 2005, and the novel has reinforced my love for the show even more. I hope we'll get more graphic novels for the series. So... He said, I decided to put this together. And uh, he's posted a picture of a mock-up for some new Captain Scarlet audio adventures. He said, I'd love to see or hear Big Finish get the cast back together. Yep. Uh, For some new audio adventures with new Captain Scarlet. What does everyone else think? I'd love this to become a reality at some point. 
What do we think, Jim? Oh, well, me too. It looks great. I love mm. that cover. It's really yes. beautiful. Um, Absolutely. Very, yeah. very cool. So, I, yep. I mean, it's definitely on my radar as a thing mm. that would be nice. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. all I can say, really. Fair enough. Rob Doyle posted, uh, finished New Captain Scarlet Operation Sabre, and I loved it. I'm a big New Captain Scarlet fan, and it does feel like a continuation of the series. Chris Thompson and Andrew Clement's story are exciting. They pay homage to what's gone before while heading the story into a new direction. Connor Flanagan's art complements them perfectly. I love the detail in his style. Overall, I'd give this graphic novel... 9 out of 10. Looking forward to nice. more in the future. And isn't it about time we got some audio adventures for new Captain Scarlet? You see, there we go again. Yeah, That's Rob Doyle. Interesting that somebody else is requesting that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve Rogers. Well, he says, the new Captain Scarlet Operation Sabre, what a fantastic read. Chris Thompson has written an amazing story that could have easily kicked off season three of New Captain Scarlet. It's fast-paced and literally a page-turner. The story's presented in three parts, which gives us two jaw-dropping cliffhangers, especially the first one. Steve says, Connor Flanagan's artwork has taken an amazing story and turned it into an awesome one. His dynamic page and panel layouts bring a rich texture and life to the story. They're simply breathtaking. Andrew Clements rounds off the graphic novel with a short but nonetheless inspired Angels story, Skyfire. It's another action-packed, fast-paced story of the Angels saving the day by doing it Thunderbird style. You'll know what I mean when you read it. Mm. Again, Connor brings the whole story to life with some superb page layouts. Bonus material includes illustrated info guides on the Rhino sky base and the Spectrum Albatross two pages of notes from Connor and the amazing number of easter eggs hidden in the artwork including a certain battery boy all in a joyous read whilst I battle Covid yes says Steve it finally got me which I'd recommend any Captain Scarlet fan to buy well there we are well I hope it got you through Covid okay uh, Steve and you're feeling a bit stronger now Hannah said it's been a very hot day for the Podstrons today, and I hope everyone is coping okay. It's probably the perfect weather to watch an Anderson episode that features extreme cold to help keep cool. Or has <laughs> anyone else decided to turn up the heat even more instead? She says, for me, it's either pink ice or sun probe. But which is yours? Well, it wouldn't be mm. sun probe. <clears throat> no, well, I mean, I'd go for, I, of course, I'd head straight for Space Precinct, and of I'd go for Hate Street with the green snow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 Lovely green <laughs> snow. Yeah, cool down in that. Phil Lawrence says, just had a very busy weekend selling programmes at the Southport Air Show. I'm an air scout leader and was there with my scouts. And at the start of the show on Saturday, it was marked with the Thunderbirds theme being played on the loudspeakers. Having nice. five, four, three, two, one, Thunderbirds are go. Beginning a weekend featuring a Spitfire, a Typhoon, both flying together at one point, a Lancaster and the Red Arrows is an epic way to get things going. What I'd like to know is if anyone knows of other air shows that open open this way well surely Quite it should be few. the law that yeah. all of them open absolutely. that way absolutely that's right. Now, finally, I had a little chat with the Podstrons online the other day, some of them uh, as we were uh, marking the passing of, uh, of Simon Allen. And uh, actually, we, we spoke about uh, a great many things and uh, someone came up with the idea of uh, things that annoy you when people get Jerry Anderson wrong. So here's a, a kind of a loose new item for the podcast. Stop getting Anderson wrong. Email us in or put it up on the Facebook group and tell us what annoys you when people get Anderson wrong. For example, I think Willow mentioned it when people say that the puppets are made of wood. Or, of yeah. course, there's a perennial misspelling of Tracy with an E. T-R-A-C-E-Y. Or, or Captain e Scarlet with two Ts. Right. So mm. give me your examples that really annoy you. Stop getting Anderson wrong. Can, Let me know can we, can we come up goat? with a catchier name than that? Can it be and and a wrongs? Uh, okay, there you go. Is that, is that okay? And a wrongs. Yeah. If you're on Twitter, hashtag it and a wrongs. A n d e w r o n g s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're on the Facebook group, post them there or email us in podcast at jerryanderson.com and put it in the subject line and a wrongs. A n d e w r o n g s. And I'll read them out next time. <laughs> yes. And now we're going to get people saying, oh, I really hate it when they spell and a wrongs and a wrong because, you know, people think it's and yes. you wrong and now. Yes. Oh, dear. yes. And a wrong. Yes. Oh, exactly. Dear. Yeah. Mm -mm. Anyway, there okay. We well, I yeah. look forward to your future and a wrongs. <laughs> and uh, if you can think of a better name, yeah. then let us know. Sorry, yes, do yeah, carry exactly. On. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I just think that's all for now. But uh, it's a very busy and lively group over on, on Facebook. So uh, if you'd like to join in the fun, simply head on over to the podcast official listeners Facebook group, answer a few questions, and we'll let you win. Or not. Yeah, or not. Yes, if Richard's yes. feeling particularly cruel, he'll, he'll, he won't. <laughs> 
Anyway, Richard James, <clears throat> yeah, everyone's us. welcome here, even those who are not expert Ander fans. And one of oh, those sure. is conductor George Morton. Mm. Uh, he was on last week and he's back today. He's a top-notch conductor and arranger of all kinds of music from classical to film schools. Uh, best known to Anderson fans, of course, for conducting Stand By for Action, uh, April Just Gone. And he has a rather unique perspective, I think, on the music of Barry Gray and the other composers. So, without further ado, here is George Morton, part two. In terms of uh, musical styles, then, George, because you, you have, in a very short space of time, in a really intensive way, got to know all these composers' work. So I'm not going to ask you to pick a favourite, don't worry, because that wouldn't be fair or professional or possible, of course, because they're all brilliant. But I just wondered if you could, from your point of view, just talk us through what you think are the hallmarks of those each of those composers. I mean, you only get one Derek Wasworth piece, so that's tougher. But from, from a conductor's point of view, and for some, somebody coming to it afresh, what makes Barry Gray Barry Gray? What makes Crispin... Crispin and and Richard and Derek too, if if you can find uh, enough material to call upon for that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think that as, as as I'm glad you said, don't pick a favourite. <laughs> Go on, be, if you also, want to pick a favourite, no, you can. No, I mean, I, I will I will do it at the end, but okay, it's probably going to be an obvious one. But but I think I think what what all four composers did was so perfect for the program for the for the material on screen yeah um and and that's that's like the sign of a really fantastic composer for film or tv isn't it that that you don't you don't think well this music's okay but it doesn't fit with what's happening it's yeah and i think when you when you look at uh barry gray's music you can hear kind of the era of the 70s and 80s music in it of the time you can hear it develop from that very early stuff into the Thunderbirds and the Captain Scarlet. There's a lot of kind of really lovely percussion stuff going, like driving, lots of fantastic kind of counter melodies in the violins where they get all this like really fast moving stuff around everything else that's happening, which is which is really cool. But but also Barry Gray, you, you listen to Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and you think, oh well it's, it's how it writes and then and then you hear uh, the, the, the detective, what's he called? Um, gosh, Joe Ninety. Are you thinking? Secret Service. Secret Service. Yeah, um, which is if you completely didn't know any of this music and you didn't know anything about Barry Gray, and you you put the Thunderbirds March up against the kind of the Swingle Singers. You know the 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 Duba 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 singing yeah, stuff the swingle singer stuff think, it's, it's it's a completely different completely different composer <laughs> which is quite amazing really, isn't it yeah and to think that that's that he could do that and and fit it and and clearly there's a lot of thought that went into barry gray's music to the oh, picture yeah. he, he he didn't just churn out music that you know it would work it was just there was a, some thought behind the process of it all which is which is fantastic. I mean, it's just it's unforgettable stuff, isn't it? It's, yeah. And we did that in the evening, and straight straight followed by UFO, which is kind of a seventies eighties funk, isn't it? And it's it's again so different. Um, so yeah, I, it's hard to compare them, isn't it? Crispin Mill's oh, stuff is. You don't have to compare oh, them, George. It's fine. You no, can no, no, you no, can no. you can praise <laughs> them all separately uh, and equally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good. <laughs> <laughs> um Crispin's music um that was all new Captain Scarlet stuff isn't it yeah Lavender Castle um, Space, Space Precinct, Precinct new Captain Saint. Scarlet yeah, yeah. I get, like I said earlier really kind of rhythmically driven quite clever in how he writes clearly it's it's not just kind of your standard 4-4 four, four predictable kind of chord sequences nothing no. predictable about it and in, and in the best possible way actually and really driven, really, really lots of energy into it all. Huge amounts of energy, I think. I think, I think he's clearly, clearly, yeah, enthusiastically energetic, the music, which is which is great. And again, it, 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 it matches the picture so well. And also writing, New Captain Scarlet must have been an absolute 
pig to have to write music for because it'd be impossible not to listen to Barry Gray and think of Barry Gray while you're doing it, right? Uh, I think he had a real challenge there, but da- Dad was fairly adamant actually to to move away from that. And I don't, but I don't think that Barry Gray stuff would have fitted. No, you know the C- the CGI, the, the faster cutting action, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure if Barry's alive to do it, he would have done something, but it wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have copied himself. He would have, he would have evolved it too. So you're right. It is very fitting in terms of its evolution, I think. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it was just, everything was great fun. I don't know, but I loved, I loved everything. My two favourites, <laughs> yes, which is Rogue, is absolutely the Thunderbirds march. Obviously, because, that's fair. Just because, I mean, come on, it's it's just amazing. But then, but then the I wish I was a cowboy, which uh, spaceman. Sorry, I wish I was a space, I'm a cowboy. I wish I was a spaceman. Yeah, should be really on, and that's um, Fireball what's XL Five. It's the end titles from Fireball XL Five. XL Five. Yeah, uh, I just it's I I find myself waking up in the morning going, I wish I was a spaceman. <laughs> A fireball XL5, of course, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And I it, don't know why it just went round and round and round and yeah. round. I had the same, actually, it's a, a, across all be- before and since. Not just uh, a Spaceman, but uh, Aquamarina and the Captain Scarlet song. And so many of those songs really, they just stick. Um, yeah. I mean, they're, they're vet, they feel older, more old fashioned, don't they? automatically and though the, the the stuff with lyrics stops in 67 with with captain scarlet i don't think you really yeah. count the secret service with dooba dooba doos and a hymn they're not they're not yeah. lyrics about the show no uh, and yet these these early ones they, it's not just the music that's great i think the lyrics are great and barry did but did it all too did he uh, write the lyrics as well wow yeah yeah uh, it's he, just some people are amazing aren't they yeah and do you do your dad do your dad give him free reign with that do you know as far as I know, pretty much. I mean, um, I, there's a, I've got some, when we were doing some research for the documentary, uh, he talked about Captain Scarlet specifically, Dad did on the on the audio tapes, and said that he he asked Barry for something um, that would give them a scene transition. Uh, and he was thinking a kind of big, big sort of brass fanfare with loads of timps and stuff in it. And then Barry came back with the dum, 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 dum. And Dad reaction was well that's not what i was thinking at all but sort of great and it's barry so even when he was given specific pitches for stuff and requests i think barry kind of just did the very best for the for the picture but i mean uh, that's 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 showing a a immense amount of trust isn't it between the two of them and and you and it's it's lovely and you can you can really tell in the music that that your dad trusted all of these composers yeah because because he clearly knew what he was talking about musically, but he also worked with phenomenally gifted composers who would bring their own expertise to it. Yeah, I think that was kind of uh, reflective of, of every department, actually. Like, he knew the things he knew, he knew the things that he didn't know, but he still had an idea of what he wanted. So, mu- you know, music, he, he couldn't read music, he had no musical training whatsoever, um, but he knew, he knew stuff from the world of music that he liked. Um, and yeah. lots of stuff that he was kind of very fond of, like um, uh, Ravel and that kind of stuff. He, you know, he was yeah. a big fan of that before he met Barry, before he got into TV. So it like those big things, uh, Rhapsody in Blue. He was a huge fan of. I can instantly yeah. see how those things could have informed at least working with Barry, if not what he was asking yeah. for. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? He's he he found composers that did an amazing job on it all yeah and that's that's not easy to do is it and it's it's not easy to find someone particularly like barry who who obviously did so much and then your dad must have had a fantastic ear for it to to know that to actually yeah let's go with barry gray and let's stick with him and let's because everything it just everything worked, worked didn't, it? didn't it yeah it worked incredibly well and then and then and then if he'd have when barry gray stopped composing so that's for him. And then if he'd have then had a complete flop of the next composer, then you would think, yeah. well, actually you just got lucky, but he didn't, did he? So no, I mean, I think Derek, Derek was with music was great. And then Richard's music was great. That's and then Chris, Finney, 
Uh, so Derek was with the second series of 1999. 1999, yeah. And then Richard on uh, Terror Hawks, and then Terror on Hawks. to on to Crispin, pretty much. Um, Crispin, yeah. And they were all they were all you know they were all partnerships that worked really really well. I think so. Yeah. Very positive stuff. Um, George, our time is rapidly running out, but I'm going to go from asking you about the nice qualities of these things to the awkward question of what was or what were your least favourite piece or pieces and why? Um, I've got a least I've got a least favourite in mind. There was one in, one song in particular which I I'm glad it was there for comedy purposes, but I don't think we'd include in a future edition if we were to do one in the future. But go on, over to you. Okay, uh, if we were doing in the future, hint, hint. Yeah, we go. No, no, it's only. Um, I'm just saying if. I'm not okay, saying anything I else. Guess, can I guess which one you you particularly were that fond of? Go for and it. You said a song. It was a song. Yeah, I mean, I think there's only one really which sort of sticks out as. I don't know. It just I didn't I didn't enjoy it as much. It was nothing down to, nothing to do with the performance. Um, yeah. Okay. Was it Pongo the Pirate? <laughs> well spotted, yes. I, yeah. I, I, I don't think we That's need Pongo. That's of its time, isn't it? That's really of its time. Yeah, I mean, we had concerns about the lyrics up front on that because he likes to pinch and slap or something. Pinch and slap, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of uh, <laughs> not particularly um, appropriate these yes. days. Yes. But I mean, yeah. it's, again, that's a, it's a really catchy song though, isn't it? <laughs> I, I mean, that, annoyingly, it's in well. my mind's ear currently as much as I don't want it to be, but I think I yeah. would like it not to be in the future. Um, yeah. So, so that's what, mine. Do you want you can't me to have that say, as well. No, I know, I know. I don't know whether to go with something that was really hard to get together or something that I'm just looking through the scores again. I think you could pick Let's one that was l- least to your taste musically and the one that was the hardest to get together. How about that? So then you don't have to pick on the sort of the useless child, essentially. Okay, the useless child. Um, do you know what? And I, This is, again, if I've not already offended your listeners wildly at this point, I, I probably am no, going to get hate mail, but... The March of the Oysters. Okay. I just, yeah, I, I struggled. I mean, it's 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 well written. It's it, it's, it's lovely. Clearly, very well. Yeah, it's lovely. But I don't know. It doesn't seem to do very much for me personally. Oh. Yes, yeah, so if you know. want to send in your hate mail, please do write to George Morton <laughs> at uh... <laughs> <laughs> at please don't. <laughs> No, no. Yeah. This is it. It's the whole part of it is kind of it's lovely that, that everyone will have favourites, everyone will have least favourites, but there's so much to choose from. So March of the yeah. Oysters wasn't for you. I, I kind of get that, but it is, for, for fans, it's such a well-known piece that people kind of really love. And it's got those I lovely know, just... lovely moments of suspense and build up into the next bit of the march and stuff, which I think people kind of yeah. go, oh, ooh, but I can I can see it. Okay. I know, I know, it's bad, isn't it? But, Anything hey. else you want to pick on? No, I don't think so. I think oh, it, was, okay. it was just it was just nice to explore all of this different music and and yeah, I, I don't know. I like, I like, yeah. Mister On's theme was great fun to do. That was lovely, <laughs> and with the Omar to know and yeah, and that's and that's not. I mean, that's not too dissimilar in kind of feel to the. Aquamarino, it's kind of that kind of slower groove a bit. But yeah. I, yeah, I don't know why it's Aquamarino's. Okay, that's that's fine. We can we can excuse you for all that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so two more questions for you, George. Yeah. One is, if you could do it all again, yeah. what would you change about the concert? <laughs> what would I change? That's a very, very good question, isn't it? I think maybe trying to come up or have a bit of a longer narrative in each part, because yep. as I said earlier, everything was at most four and a half minutes. Most things were two, 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 three, two, 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 two like minutes. Yep. Which was which was great and it was a very much whistle stop tour of everything, wasn't it? Yeah. 
but I think what what that did is it showcased the music really nicely, but it didn't showcase as well as I think it probably could have done. Maybe the narrative of your dad's career, yes, and natural because obviously it was a concert, but but we were there to see what was on screen and the music enhanced and and celebrated that as well. And so I, I think to do things in a little bit longer medley kind of chunks and to see how this goes into this, into this and kind yeah. of look at the different eras of, of Jerry I Anderson agree. I agree. TV stuff. And I think that's, that's the, that's the only thing that in my mind it stood out because it was so bam, 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 bam. It must've been quite tiring for an audience member yeah. i think there was a lot of kind of some of them were like one minute oh applause oh go into the next one oh so yeah no i i i'm definitely thinking of th- if 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 there's a future one if big if huge if, if, if enormous one, if, underlined if. emboldened italic if there uh yeah. then more sweets more kind of an overarching narrative yeah. and my final question based on all the music that you have now heard and conducted which of the shows or the projects would you most like to watch based solely on the music experience that you've had so oh. far? And you can't include Thunderbirds or Scarlet or Stingray because you, you're already aware Scarlet. of those. Ah. So it has to be oh, one, of, hard, one of the others that, that where the music is so um, kind of rousing or so curiosity driving that you're like, that, that's the one that draws me in the most musically. Sorry to Jamie make Anderson. you pick. Right. What a question. And, and Potter, yes. George is now furiously flipping through his scores to I mean, make sure he makes the right decision just, here. Well, yeah, I just need to, to think, don't I? Yeah, don't blow it, George, because this, this could be I like... This is, I could say... This is the defining moment between George is a hero pedos. or George is getting yeah. hate mail. It's, <laughs> <laughs> so, so choose wisely. Oh, my gosh. I'm slightly concerned that you're going to make a choice which I would not be very happy with as well. So, oh. oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what? And by that, do you mean because you don't like it? Potentially, because it's oh, it's one no. that's got a great theme, and I really do like the theme, but the content I'm not so keen on. So, oh, okay. So it's not against the music; it's against the actual show. It is. And yeah, is it one that I'm I biased. conducted. I'm not. Is it George, one that I'm, I'm we're not getting into this, George. <laughs> ah, I've asked you a question because, because funnily enough, it, it, listening to. And this is going to sound very sycophantic, but it's absolutely not. But the the big piece that I didn't conduct was the Terror Hawks suite, mm. and I maybe it's because I was in the in the one well, the wings in the concert in the audience for the rehearsal, and yeah. it was just absolutely spectacular musically. And is is that what you were thinking? Is that pants? No, I is love Terror Hawks. For brilliant. me, you've I'll given the correct then. answer. Uh, so that's that's great. Actually, Terror Hawks is a really good one because. It's not got the best reputation amongst fans generally because it came in a separate yeah. era. It was very different to what came before. It wasn't what people were expecting. And you heard that amongst the audience where John Coleshaw did his intro and said, and now we come to the 1980s and Terror Hawks. And the, oh. the, the applause was so <laughs> but- muted compared to all the other shows that had been mentioned. Yeah. And yet at the end of that suite, people were on their feet few people yeah. crying huge great roar it was such a lovely thing so i'm i'm actually really glad it's had that effect that's really interesting because because the the fans clearly were absolutely a gog with richard harvey and in love with yeah. him and, and he's he did he's an amazing a job. superstar and, but he's a superstar <laughs> in jerry anderson world isn't he so well, so that's really interesting that, that he doesn't that's get a huge that. amount of recognition, I have to say, because because yeah. of his association with the one show. So I think to come out and then yeah. to do his thing where he was almost taking off himself, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Okay. So Terror Hawks is my answer, and apparently that's the right answer, but it was the genuine the right answer, answer as well. It wasn't a political answer. <laughs> no, that's a very good answer. I'll tell you what, the wrong answer would have been Joe Ninety, by the way. Uh, Joe Ninety. Well, I did. I mean, yeah, yeah, great music. But just watching the the opening credits, yeah. <laughs> okay, good, fine. Uh, George, fine. You're, you've remained in my good books, even if not in the listeners' ones. So thanks, thanks for that. Goodness for that. <laughs> uh, George, if people want to find out more about you or follow you stalker-like on social media, where may they do so? Okay, so uh, my website is georgeconduct.co.uk. Makes sense. Um, original, right? 
And then on Facebook, I'm at, I don't even know what my handle is. I think it's at George underscore conducts as well. But it's, if you search George Morton conductor arranger, it comes up somewhere. Brilliant. And I, and I've started trying to go into the murky worlds of Instagram as a, and Ooh. promote myself there, but oh, it's so hard to remember to do, isn't it? It is, <laughs> <laughs> it is yes, tricky stuff with it, keeping up with all of it. But there you go. Hopefully, uh, a few of our podcasters will come and follow you and say hello. And if they were at the Thanks concert, so much, thank yeah. you for your lovely work. Thank so, you. Thank you, George, for your great work. It was brilliant to see. I was glad to see you got into your Thunderbird One T-shirt for the second half of the show. Brilliant. Very yeah. nice. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and if, no- if, if, if it happens again, yes, I will be. I will be dressing up. You can. You heard it here first. I will make sure I have a full outfit. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Can I dictate what character you dress up as? Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Within reason. No, you. Yeah, sorry, the contract was made I've after you able, said I've yes. I've got to be able to. I've got to be able to conduct. That's the only. Yeah, don't worry. I'm not going to restrict your arms or anything. But I, I've got some ideas. Okay. okay. Uh, brilliant. Okay. Uh, Potterons, if you've got any ideas about what George is dress up to, up as, email us podcast at jerryanson dot com. Uh, he's in for it now. Uh, George, thanks. You've been brilliant, and um, maybe, possibly, if see you soon. Who knows? Hopefully. Thank you so much, Jamie. This has been a real pleasure. Cheers, George. Uh, George, thank you so much. I loved our yeah. little chat. I loved the fact Great. that he was there with his scores, flicking through, remembering mm. little bits and pieces. And yeah. Yes. Uh, now, as we proved there, you can enjoy Anderson through any aspect the visuals, the stories, the characters, the music, the production methods, whatever. Mm. There's all sorts of ways to access it. You don't have to know yeah. everything. Um, no. And I think George is a great example of that. So you can find out more about George on his website, georgeconducts.co.uk, or you can follow him on any social platform you like, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I don't think he's yet on TikTok, but maybe he is. He might be. Yeah. George doing, you know, uh, lip syncing and dances over there. Okay. Maybe, maybe not yet. Do? Um, I don't know. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's what the, that's what the, the youth okay, do what on the young kids TikTok. Are doing. Okay, great. Of course. Fine. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, also tell us a bit more about Standby for Action. When when's the uh, DVD and the Blu-ray and the CD? I mean, how's it all looking? When's oh, it all coming out? So mm. the the soundtrack has now been fully edited and has gone off to silver screen for approval. So that should go into production shortly, and I think it'll be probably a matter of weeks before that one's out. The DVD Blu-ray, we are still editing, still putting clips in, doing a few little bits of adjustment, putting in a, a trivia track as well onto that. So as you go, you'll learn bits and pieces about the music, about the shows, about the people involved, just to sort of heighten and enhance the experience. So even if you weren't there, even if you were Mm. there, you'll Mm -hmm. still kind of take something new away from it. Um, Nice. But it's it's rather lovely. So a little bit longer for the DVD Blu-ray. Sorry, it's it's often the case. These things become more complicated than we could have imagined. Um, But the, the the soundtrack sounds glorious i bet i bet a wonderful memento of a fantastic evening uh, which if you weren't there you can sample yourself so that, that's quite nice isn't it uh, now before we head on over to chris dale and his randomizer which mm. i think is coming up next uh, i'm just gonna head over to twitter because lost in transition uh tweeted an appreciative post for everyone involved in the jerry anderson podcast and all who sail in her you make my monday morning journey to and from work a joy even when my day makes me feel like this and he posted a picture of himself looking, or someone, looking rather nonplussed. But I'm glad we helped you on your journey. <laughs> uh, Brian B. Bunny says, and by the way, happy birthday to the randomizer himself, Chris Dale. Let Jamie yes. and Richard wish you many happy returns the next time we all listen to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Well, yes, a happy belated birthday to the uh, the Pope of all things random, Chris Dale. <laughs> the Pope of all things random. Now, it's funny you say that. <laughs> oh, yes. Because you, oh. you can see what he's done I can now. see. Yes, I can. I, wow. I mean, I, I never thought I'd see Chris Dale sculpting himself. I know. As it, it, his as holiness. the Bishop of Rome. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But he's done the, it. The mitre and the, and the, the crook. and it's, it's, everything. It's, it's all there. It's incredibly detailed. It's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's really, really beautiful. And I think he's yeah. even carved it in so you can do that thing where you pour a drink in at the top and it comes oh, out there. Of course he has. Oh, Lovely. yeah. Well, I'm not sure that was a when great choice for it. Oh, is that no, where it comes out? that wasn't oh. a good idea. Anyway, I think I'll pass on that. Don't worry, Chris. We'll keep it cool while you um, while you do the randomizer. But I probably won't have a drink. Thanks very much. Yeah, so um, thanks. Anyway, uh, now Chris has finished his other amazing skill of ice sculpting. He's over here with the randomizer, pressing the randomizer's big red button, and picking a random Jerry Anson series and a random episode of that series, and then telling you all about it in a yeah. really funny and interesting way. So yeah, 
Here's Chris being funny and interesting. Again. Uh, good evening, madame. Uh, can I help you? Ah, oh, yes, good evening. Uh, silly question, but my friend Marina here has the feeling she may have seen you somewhere before. I'm pretty sure she's wrong. I mean, we went to the heraldic archives today and, and then a little cafe, and I never noticed anyone who looked even remotely like you. <laughs> I am your new attendant, madame. I shall be taking care of you for the second half of the journey. Ah, happy now, Marina? No? Oh, well, never mind. Uh, still, while we've got you, sir, perhaps you'd like to have a go on this. A brilliant achievement, and one which I intend to make use of. Does that mean you'll press the button for us today? Yes, I think uh, you've come to the right place. Great, thank you. A most interesting device. Isn't it? I get the feeling you're rather hoping to do some good with it today. Oh, a great deal of good. That's the spirit. Right, let's see what we've got. Ah, okay. Well, this should please quite a few people, as we're back with the original Captain Scarlet today for Manhunt. I shall have to turn out the lights. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's very considerate of you. Oh, do stop frowning, Marina. Leading the fight, one man fate has made indestructible. His name, Captain Scarlet. So, welcome back to the randomizer, the original Captain Scarlet. It's been, oh, about uh, ten weeks or so since we were last here with another very early episode, Winged Assassin. And here we are with episode four. I kept myself informed. Manhunt. This is your report? Yes, sir. It's very small and looks like a screw. Yeah, this is, um, how far technology has come. Oh, dear. Got Captain Blue and I investigated reported Mistron activities in Sydney, Australia. Oh, it's gone. You were injured, Captain Scarlet. Very slightly, sir. I'm fine now. Mm, well, all this is very straightforward. I bruised my elbow, but I was a brave boy, Colonel. We must conclude from our inquiries that there was no Mistron activities, and it was in fact a false alarm. Scarlet, Captain Blue, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of Spectrum for your courage and devotion to our cause. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> The Mistron. Firstly, I love that they're getting congratulated for having done absolutely nothing. Secondly, I love the uh, appalling grammar in Scarlet's report, which basically is only six lines. You, you, you do, you know, you have to do more work for a primary school book report than Spectrum captains have to do uh, investigating suspicious goings on in Australia, which of course were not suspicious at all. I'm just checking the fourth floor D block. Right, Harris. I'll put the coffee on. I like also that they answer with each other's voices. <laughs> it's it's just one of those things, and it keeps coming up in these Super Mario Nation shows. But hey ho. Oh, this is a uh, Harris the guard. He's at the Culver Atomic Center, and a door marked laboratory has just closed behind him. Now, yeah, this being, I think this is the fifth episode in production order. After the Mistron's Winged Assassin, Big Ben strikes again, and Point Seven Eight Three, which is a, an early episode in production order. But here we go with the fifth episode in production order. We're finally going to get to uh, really dig into what Captain Black is up to now that he's back on Earth. We've seen him in all all those episodes. Oh, he's it conked Harris on the head with the back of his pistol. But we've never actually... Uh, this is the first time that Spectrum are going to find out that he's... Uh, Alive-ish and uh, well-ish, and of course working for the Mistrons. And this is something that I I never noticed, and I've seen this episode a lot, but I'd never noticed until the Blu-rays. The amount of blood on the back of Harris's head there as he gets clobbered. That's a really nasty head injury. But luckily he's got a chest-mounted alarm on a sort of sash belt thing he has to wear. What is it, Harris? Harris, Harris, are you all right? <laughs> this is Richard. Well, he's pressed his alarm button, so. Probably he's not all right. Security break, block D. Seal all exits. But I love the look of this this atomic center. All these sirens as well. That's a lovely, cool noise that we hear so many times throughout the series. And speaking of hearing things, we are going to hear from some uh, Super Mario Nation voice artists that... Uh, well, at least in broadcast order. This is often shown as episode four. We haven't yet heard on the show before. Um, this is, along with 
This is the first episode that David Healy did voices in, and I think possibly Gary Files and Martin King also join at this point. Um, depends what way round you want to look at Manhunt or Point Seven Eight Three. You started the shockwave with your unprovoked attack on our Martian complex. This act of aggression will be revenged. I love that there's no real threat in this episode as such. Be slow. It's just more, uh, less effective. The Mr. On sort of phoning in to give a reminder. We'll pay in full. And I have the image of, of the Cloud Base crew sitting around afterwards saying, well, okay, what, what was that about? We already know all that. Who are they threatening? What are they doing this week? But of course, it's, um,. I don't know, it's almost like having made a, a bit of a slip-up, as we're about to discover with Captain Black, the Mistrons are sort of phoning up to say, well, you know, we're still scary, but we made a little mistake. Members of Spectrum... All three of you... ...have made their first mistake. Yes, it's just Scarlet, Blue and Symphony for some reason in the officer's lounge. Looking at the screen... It looks like Captain Black. Yes. It is indeed. This photograph was taken by a concealed security camera at the Culver Atomic Center and has been positively identified as Captain Black. By his mother. Oh no, she's dead, isn't she, in, uh, in Captain Black's backstory. Suspicions were well-founded. From the moment he returned to Earth from the Martian expedition, Captain Black has been working for the Mistrons. Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, we go... We have confirmation in the first episode that Black returned to Earth. Colonel White confirms that, and after that, they've no idea where he went for four episodes. And we've seen him hanging around with binoculars and such. Just to remind us that he's still part of the show. And legend has it that he was never meant to be part of the show. He just, he was supposed to die at the end of the first episode. And because he looked so good, they decided to keep him on. I've never been entirely sure if that's true or not. But the fact that in Winged Assassin, Big Ben Strikes Again, and Point Seven Eight Three, he's just kind of hanging around, doing things that don't really need to be done. Tiger counters, we'll be able to track down... Maybe that was the case, but this is the first time we get actual... Okay, Captain Black is part of this show. Captain Black is on. And we're going to find him. And going forward, that's a, a big part of the... Uh, well, not a big part, but it's a, a significant part of the series' uh, regular makeup. Got to keep an eye out for Captain Black. What's he up to this week? And also, I like... I really like with this episode... For once, and it's not something you can say about them very often, Spectrum are actually throwing their all into an operation. We have got angels taking off. We've got radar vans. Uh, although that one seemed to be uh, driving into the uh, into the bank on the side of the road. Captain Black shoes. I'd head for the city, not the wide open spaces. We have to cover every possibility. <laughs> I do love that line as well. We won't find Captain Black in wide open spaces. He won't be standing in a field with his arms wide open. Ah, oh, but here we go. Where are we going to go pick up an SPV? Hmm. Aptly named. How's that? Stone Point Village. SPV. <laughs> That's a Captain Scarlet humour. Switch on the display, Lieutenant. Right, sir. It's like regular humour, but slightly clunky. Get the positions of the detector trucks carrying the directional Geiger counters. But they know roughly where Captain Black is, and we have... My goodness, we have eight detector trucks on the search. As well as um, Scarlet and Blue in their car. And I do like the look of these vans, actually. It's... Um, they never appeared again, I think, aside from stock footage in Trouble Cross, we never actually see these machines in action again. Which is a shame, because they look quite nice, and inside we have what I think is a redress of the Zero X uh, set. Nothing above natural radiation. A Captain Grey, and, um, well, it's the Lieutenant Dean puppet, again, uh, playing, a sh uh, I nearly said Shadow, <laughs> Spectrum uh, Radar Van Technician Guy. Sir, can I fly down and help in the manhunt? No, Lieutenant, I need you here. But this is fun. The area's completely surrounded. All we can do is watch as they close in. I'm sorry. If Captain Black is to be caught, we must make sure Central Control is fully manned. All two of us. I just wish I could meet him face to face. Just once. Did you never meet him? Did you ne never meet him before he went to Mars? Uh, I get that it probably th it's, it's probably meant to mean I wish I could see him face to face now, but... Unfortunately, as this poor old garage mechanic is about to discover, generally if you meet Captain Black face to face, um, well... Your dental records had better be up to date, because often that's the only way people are ever going to identify your remains. Be with you in a minute, sir. Just fixing this wine. And yes, here we go, a memorably gruesome scene. 
backed by the Crossroads to Crime theme, of all things. Hey, what are you doing? Which we've heard as background music before in uh, Robot Freighter Mystery. And yeah, this is an ep- this is a scene, rather, that uh, a lot of people point to being one of the most gruesome in the series, and I would tend to agree. Um, were it not for the fact that I don't believe any garage has ever worked this way, with a, a ramp that can be pressed into the ceiling so hard that the ceiling begins to fracture... But it's a horrible image. And then coming back to the uh, the poor mechanic crushed. And again, seeing it on Blu-ray, it's not just he's bleeding from the nose and the mouth, which is nasty enough, but he's bleeding from the chest. You can see what looks like part of the dashboard has impacted into his chest. It's very nasty. Captain Scarlet, we're about to pick up a Spectrum Pursuit vehicle. And it looks like my hat is sliding off. Not yet, but I'll keep you informed. There it is ahead. There's another Delta petrol station. Again, I like uh, I like little bits of world building in Captain Scarlet. Lots of Delta petrol stations. No one around though. Delta economy. Where is everyone? I don't know. There should be somebody around. I've been expecting you. you well, this is the world of Captain Scarlet, of course. We only ever get one one person in one room, and it's often a very big room. It's hidden in a dummy oil storage tank. I'll get the key. Stay back here with me. I'm scared of garage mechanics. Let's see, uh... Ah, here it is. Oh, but he's got a gun. And... Whoa, Scarlet got him first. You knew it was a trap. I suspected it. How? He didn't ask for our identification. <laughs> yes, not the, uh... Not my sixth sense is tingling, but, uh... Work of the Mr. Ron. He didn't ask for our identification. That's something that, you know, if you're having a very busy day... And two guys who are obviously Spectrum captains show up in their Spectrum car... Maybe you wouldn't necessarily always ask for their identification. And recently. But Scarlet's not having any of that. That's a that's an executable offence. Not asking for ID. Seven eight two. I also noticed that there's a calendar on the mechanic's desk there. It's dated the thirteenth. I wonder which month could be July. The position of that filling station. Or oh, right in the middle of the network. Yes, Lieutenant. If Captain Black was there, he is indeed in our net. Ah. All we have to do is. Tighten it. I love the uh, the lettering on the screen, Colonel White's screen, where all the well the map is and the positions of all the trucks. But I also love that they've put little um, letter set letters on there. Yes, it's it's a positive bearing. And someone's a- affixed the instant lettering, which I guess is some part of logo from the letter set sheet. Bearing of. And yet we get a massive close up on it as we zoom in for the advert break. 023.17. I'm not sure that was meant to be as visible as it is. And of course, in HD, it, it's crystal clear now. Other tracking vehicles. Yes, sir. See, this is what I find frustrating about Spectrum. They're so competent in this episode, and yet in so many others, it's just, ah, Captain Scarlet, Captain Blue, go off and protect Africa. The whole thing, by yourselves. Whereas here, this is this is how a, a global security organization should respond. And I get, you know, we can't, we don't have enough puppets or uh, vehicles to to, to show a, a large operation. There it is. We found it. As would befit an organization like this. Order the but in episodes like this, when you see contact, yes, sir. Really strong professional response from Spectrum, for the most part. Area reference. Here's someone who's going to let us down later in the episode. Black is believed to be in this. Visit. Oh, Symphony Angel. Yes, it's very refreshing. F I G. As I said, after some episodes where they either don't have a brain cell to rub between them, or they just only send two guys. Black should reach your checkpoint in approximately two minutes. What sort of vehicle is he driving? And Captain Oka is on the scene, manning a checkpoint. Spectrum pursuit vehicle. 0782. I also love that so much of this is taking place in, in sleepy villages and countryside, uh, which I suppose you know it would uh, it would be a, a very different story if it was taking place in the city. I think they could do it, but it's it's nicer in in, in the countryside. I think it's a very nice looking episode. This one. Highway 74. Confirm SPV as hostile vehicle. You know what to do. Don't worry, Lieutenant. We'll stop it. Yeah, he knows what to do, and that involves getting his whoever his colleague is, to drive their Spectrum car from one side of the roadblock to the other. That'll take care of it. Colonel, I'd like permission to go down there. I'm sorry, Green. I told you before, you're needed here. But, Colonel... Don't mention it again, Lieutenant. And that's an order. We have work to do. 
Why do I get the feeling that's how Colonel White responds when Lieutenant Green asks for a bathroom break? I get the feeling there's nobody on Cloud Base, really, to replace him. There's no equivalent to Lieutenant Silver. They just uh, occasionally dump magenta in his chair. Captain Black, the Earthmen have erected a roadblock ahead of you. Turn off and go back to the Atomic Center. But it's an interesting attribute to Lieutenant Green's character, especially this early on in the series, that he's already getting a bit fidgety, stuck behind that console all the time. But I also get the the feeling that um, uh, there's several characters in this episode who are almost itching for a confrontation with Captain Black, including Green, um, Scarlet and Blue, obviously, Symphony here. Continue aerial search. Ochre and Grey seem quite keen as well. Well, the angels have been flying around and they've somehow managed to lose Captain Black. Have you lost him, Colonel? No. We just don't know where he is. May just take a little longer. Oh, yes, they're all closing in now. Symphony reported the SPV pulled off the road somewhere along here. Keep your eyes open. Looks like we could see some action after all. Hmm, so much for your idea that Captain Black would head for the city. You're just a big stupid head. I'm going to keep rubbing it in. Hey, wait a minute. Slow down. That could be it. I love how there's no other traffic moving on the roads in this episode, though. This is a very, very sleepy part of the countryside with no one around at all. Not even a farmer and a puppet cow. I'll tell Cloudbase and then we'll go in. We could tell Cloudbase as we're going in, but... Oh, this is an, another lovely shot as well. First person moving into the woods with spooky music playing. And it still it still holds up very well in HD. You can see what you know, what's real and what's a painting, but right. But it looks like he headed back to the road. It's very believable, and I think a lot of it is just down to well, firstly the the skill at creating the the world, but also the music adds so much. What is it? A medallion. It's symphonies. It can't be. It's symphonies, I tell you. I gave it to her on her birthday. Oh. You're right. Look. Over there. I've never understood, though, A, how they can miss the Angel Interceptor, and B, why the camera is panning off it towards a patch of nothing to the left. You'd expect the sort of, aha, there's the Angel Interceptor, to be, like, framed front and centre, right in, you know, that's the centre of the shot. And it's just, no, we pan off that, there's some trees over there. Is Captain Black holding? That's an odd shot. Highly possible. But this operation will not be affected by consideration for any individual. Especially you. Move everyone in. Yep. And again, that's uh, another interesting aspect to the uh, the Spectrum organization and Colonel White's thinking. You know, maybe one of our people has been captured. This is bad, but... The noose is really tightening. Press on the, uh, the search. I love this music as well. I'm a big sucker for Spectrum vehicles moving around to important-sounding Spectrum music. So, yep. Ochre and Grey are, are on the move. And so, too, are Scarlet and Blue. To question where Captain Magenta is in all this, though. Uh, I get the feeling nobody told him that this was all going on. Oh dear. Nothing. Don't worry, Symphony will be all right. And more nice character stuff here, actually. Yeah, yeah, I I'm fine. The very first uh, suggestion of a romance between Blue and, and Symphony. Uh, he can't get far. Come on, Adam. You better not let the Colonel hear you call me that. All right, Snooky Pants. Blue. Yes. Also, it's strange that uh, in the, the previous episode, at least in most broadcast orders, is Big Ben Strikes Again, where Scarlet and Blue take Melody and Destiny out for dinner. I bet Symphony was pleased about that. Oh, maybe she was on duty that night. Do you have that new bearing? Yes, but there's something I... Wow! What happened? What is it? I'm getting a reading ten times normal. And this is, I think, one of the few times we see... Uh, a Spectrum uniform that isn't a captain or a lieutenant uh, or an angel or a security guard. Uh, I, th I have a feeling that uniform was probably reused as one of the Spectrum cadets in Traitor. Again, it's it's nice world building that this organization is a big organization with a lot of people and a lot of departments. You're all right. We don't know his exact position. It's something the show could have really benefited from from using more often. I think. Why go back to the Atomic Center, sir? If you want to hide an apple tree, you put it in an orchard. Ah. Captain Black must Words of wisdom from Colonel White. He returns to the atomic center. Where there is enough free radiation to make him undetectable. Exactly. Yeah. Lieutenant, I think we'll play a waiting game. 
And that's the story of Lieutenant Green's life at the moment. Just waiting, waiting for something interesting to happen. Ah, so, it's now night time. Everyone's at the Atomic Center. Are we gonna just sit here and look at each other? Oh. Big plan. What's wrong with that? Well, let's get oh, I don't want to go in and look. Our orders are to wait. What about Symphony? He conked my friend on the head. I just hope she's all right. We never find out what happened to that guy. Uh, presumably he he recovered, but to keep me here. Oh. It's only a matter of time. This is some very sinister stuff as well, though. I like as well that Symphony is trying to be brave. No. Even though she's being she's being clearly operated by a puppeteer from below there. You can see his thumb holding her and, and lifting her hand for her. But yes, I like this uh, first confrontation between a member of Spectrum and whatever it is that Captain Black has now become. And it's, uh, you know, it's not just a quick sight and then he's gone. We wait. We have a prolonged... I am sorry, Symphony Angel. Conversation. You leave me no choice. That voice. You'll never get away with this. Yeah, the, the shock in Symphony's voice at the sight and sound of what Black is now. In three minutes. That's it. We are going to radiate Symphony. And this is something I, I kind of wish, again, the show had done more of. I love this stuff of Black and, and Symphony together. And throughout the rest of the series, it was very rare that Black would ever actually uh, directly, face-to-face, -face, meet any of his old colleagues. The only time I can remember off the top of my head is um, Flight to Atlantica, when Blue and Ochre are so drunk they don't remember who he is when they bump into him. But that's a gorgeous shot of Symphony sort of starting to wilt under the radiation and the reflection of Black's just evil face. Oh, it's so good. But he's going to let her off. The Mr. Runs also have compassion. <laughs> no, you don't. I am going to give you one chance. But again, a very interesting aspect to, to their nature there. Yeah, you could kind of say, oh, well, he's just letting her off because she's a regular and it's convenient. I love that shot, by the way, of, of Scarlet and Blue and Ochre. He has the gates. Right. Make certain Captain Black is in it and don't lose him. But yeah, the idea of, you know, not just letting her off, so that she can aid in his escape. That's fine. That on its own would be uh, would be perfectly acceptable. But it's that mm, Mr. Ons also have compassion. And you're thinking, well, how much of that is them? And how much of that is black? Whatever he was before. It's so many, oh, so many just wonderful questions. And uh, we don't get any answers. But again, it, it's nice to, to have those to wrestle with. Uh, and indeed, there's various... Um, uh, fan fiction writers who've uh, pursued that um, quite extensively over the years. Anyway, the SPV is out of control, hit a tree, because it almost ran into another roadblock of uh, a patrol car and an MSV. Wow, the rarely seen MSV. I think this is the last time it appears on the show. Black, you are completely surrounded. Come out with your hands up. Yeah, they even had regular Spectrum security guards in on this mission. We're coming in. Lots of people, lots of machines. Nobody got killed. But inside the SPV... Symphony. Who nobody seems to, th to wonder, you know, maybe she could be a Mistron at this point. She's all right, Colonel. Just badly shaken. And she's lost the use of her voice, Colonel. I have to answer for her. All right, Symphony. But remember, initiative should never clash with discipline. Yes, sir. It basically means do as I tell you when I tell you to do it. Black gave you a chance to escape and you took it. He subjected you to radiation, knowing we would pick it up, think it was him in the SPV, and leave the gate unguarded. He even went through a cleansing unit before he left to get rid of his own radiation. Oh, he thinks of everything. Been tricked. But we've learned a lot. The Mistrons are capable of making mistakes. Let us take consolation from this in the continuing fight. Yeah. Again, I like that as a development. You know, it can't always be a victory, but it's nice that we learn little things that uh, either aid us in the fight or aid us psychologically like that. The gates. Don't tell anyone, Lieutenant, but that's the first time I've ever driven an SPV. I'm not quite sure what she's hinting at there. Is she hinting either that she's totally incompetent as a driver or that she's just having so much fun? Uh, I don't know. Either way, 
that's the end of Manhunt, and what a fabulous episode of Captain Scarlet. I have seen this one quite a lot over the years, so I worry sometimes that that kind of uh, dampens my enthusiasm a bit. But watching it again, particularly with uh, with reference to its place in in production order and broadcast order, it's just a it's just a revelation for the series. It opens up so many. Uh so many storytelling possibilities with the essentially the return the reintroduction almost of, of Captain Black and what that's going to mean for the series going forward up till this point it's just quick appearance here quick appearance there and now it's like oh we have got this to contend with as well so that's just lovely stuff very nice uh, confrontation between him and Symphony who was a character that was never really used as often as she might have been and speaking of it was so nice to see a full spectrum force all out looking for Black, all bar Magenta, whose absence is uh, totally unexplained. But yeah, some really nice, credible, believable action here. Some, uh, well, a very memorable moment of horror with the uh, poor old garage mechanic. And uh, yeah, some very nice uh, character moments and uh, little little action bits. So all in all, Captain Scarlet, one of the earliest triumphs, I think, of the original Captain Scarlet. Bum, 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 bum. Lovely. Nice bit of Captain Scarlet. Now, yep. another sad thing here. Mm. Normally, when we say something stupid, which is yes. quite regularly. It's quite often. Yeah. We could always count on dear Simon Allen to do an immediate photo montage of <laughs> such thing. Yes. So I'm, I'm very, very sad, additionally sad, that we won't get to see an ice sculpture version of Chris oh, Dale as the Pope. As the Pope. Yeah, that would have happened for sure. It would have been. You would have oh, been on gosh. it right now. So uh, yeah, yes, yeah. we'll we'll miss you in your joyful additions, uh, Simon. Yes. But Chris, you've got away with this time. It means you won't be seen uh, as as an ice <laughs> pope. Very strange. Yeah. The Ice Pope. I mean, that's a fantastic title for a book, isn't it? <laughs> it's a villain from Terrorhawks, isn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it must be. Yeah, that'll be. Yeah. It. Yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Chris will be back next week with another randomizer and showing off yet another of his amazing skills that he has. Oh, so many. no doubt. Yes, what a week. It's incredible. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> Have you got any more stuff or should we wrap this up? Uh, well, no, uh, that's it for now, I think. Uh, just a couple more tweets. Uh, David Lee Summers posted over on Twitter a look at uh, John Kenneth Muir's Space 1999 novel, The Forsaken, and posted a link to a, a nice review there of what he thinks of the book, so do give that a look. Uh, and our lovely own Willow posted on Twitter as uh, Willow Dragon Cat. I was at LFCC yesterday, representing the worlds of Jerry Anderson TV as John Tracy. I was surprised by how many came up to ask for a photo because they love Thunderbirds. It just goes to show that quality never goes out of fashion and that John is the best Tracy brother. Arguably, well, some might say. Now, interesting, yeah. Willow, I, there was, there's a, a company that we do some work with for marketing and advertising bits and pieces, mm -hmm. uh, and they were at LFCC, and they ah. saw you, and on a call hey. said, oh, we saw John Tracy. Oh, so, well, there, we there go. you go, you were recognised, and it was reported back to me before I even uh, saw your tweet. So, <laughs> Lovely. Nice there work. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, but that's all for now. But as you know, there are plenty of ways to get in touch. Twitter, Facebook, uh, email, YouTube. Are we on Instagram? Probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just write it down and I'll see We're it. We're everywhere. Some point. You can't get, yeah, you exactly. can't get rid of us. No, that's right. Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, thank you for your uh, ear time, everyone. Is that the right mm -hmm. phrase? It is now. Yeah, it'll do. Yeah. And uh, we will be back with pod 215 next week. Have a lovely week and stay cool and all that sort of stuff. I'm having a two and a half day holiday this week. Are you? It's a Are real sure? rarity. I'm actually taking a little break. So, um, well, good for you. Yeah. Okay. All I'm, right. Enjoy. I will. Thank you very much. Mm, Although yeah. uh, I've heard where I'm going, it's uh, it's raining on Wednesday, even though everywhere else is getting sun. So. Oh joy. Yeah. Good. Never mind. I mean, Better. I mean, what a shame. It's yeah. fine. Thanks. Thanks very yeah. much. Yeah. Anyway, I'll report mm. back. Uh, okay. Look forward to it. Have a great week. Goodbye. Yeah, and you. Bye.
Right, so rather than our usual nonsense where we talk, well, nonsense and gubbins at the mm-hmm. end, um, we've got something a little bit different for you. Uh, and Richard, you've already mentioned what it is earlier on, but do you want to intro this lovely little piece put together by the Podstrons? Yes, of course. Well, this is to mark the sad passing of our Podstron extraordinaire, the pun king himself, Simon Allen, who many of you have heard of on the podcast or have seen his work on the Facebook group. Uh, He left us just a week or so ago. And so Willow uh, collated a few messages from the Podstrons, a few memories and thoughts to mark the event. And actually, at the very end, uh, we're going to also insert Simon's legendary impersonation of Marina from Stingray. Uh, So I think I'll run it in its entirety. Brilliant. Uh, So once the voices have stopped... Pin back your ears, listen to Simon's amazing impression. See you next Incredible. week. Incredible. Thanks. This is something that I never thought I would have to do, and I still can't really believe that I'm doing it now. Simon meant a great deal to many of us, both in the podcast Facebook group, but especially those of us who attended the Potter's Arms weekly Zoom. Simon joined us on our very first Zoom and he didn't miss a week. He was always there with jokes and videos and his photo manipulations and his quiz rounds. He was an integral part in helping to build our little group from a bunch of literally virtual strangers to what we considered to be a family. And as with any family, we laughed together, we cried together, and we got through some tough times by sticking together and being there for each other. And he was a massive part of that. He was our he was our gentle giant. He was a true gentleman and he had time for absolutely everybody. I'm proud to have given him the title of Pun King, and I am extremely proud to have been able to call him my friend. Our Saturday nights, and indeed our lives, were made so much richer by having him in them. And they will not be the same without him. He will be greatly missed. And he is very much loved. This is Willow, aka Mrs John Tracy. um, Something that he did love to tease me about. Sending all of my love. And the fact that you've left us, all I can say is, how dare. Hi folks, AC here. Just wanted to say how sorry I am to hear about Simon's passing, and it seems no time at all since I was chatting with him at the Electric Cinema for Fab Live, and he seemed in great spirits and was really enjoying himself. And obviously he was always on the Podster on Zoom calls, never missed a week. And his puns are legendary, his sense of humour is endearing, and we're never going to forget him. And as others have perhaps already said, it was like one big family, and to lose someone out of that family unexpectedly, even though we we knew he hadn't been well for a while, is just uh, a very surreal and sad thing to happen, but we're never going to forget Simon. Hi Potters, it's Rob Cassidy here. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about Simon, who uh, sadly left us far too soon. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will already have mentioned his uh, supreme mastery of the pun, uh, or perhaps even his unparalleled Marina impression. Uh, I just, I, I like to remember him uh, as as the man who made me look good every weekend. Uh, he was forever photoshopping my face uh, and others uh, onto all manner of celebrities. Um, I think my favorite is probably going to be Omar Sharif. Uh, he, he did a series of, of my face on Omar Sharif, which uh, was a very entertaining evening. Um, he is going to leave a very big void in our lives, um, and in the Potter's arms. Uh, I think we'll have to have a little uh, plaque put up on his on his chair at some point. I'm, I'm, I'm as you can tell, this is very difficult for me. I'm, I'm still in a state of shock. Uh, we, 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 we loved him, um, and it, it's it's hard to accept the fact that he's he's no longer with us. 
Uh, but um, I, I hope he's in a better place. He's, he's probably hanging out with his old neighbor, Shane Rimmer, as, as we speak. Um, I take a little bit of comfort in that. To everything that might have been, to everything that was, goodbye, Simon. Love you. Simon, Scarlet, Black Widow, Alan. A giant of a man and a unique character. Sadly, his Zoom box will forever be empty, but the memories he left behind will not. And I'm so glad that I knew him, even though it was just for a very short time. And the character he had was definitely something I'll never forget. But it's a very sad time for us, and I can only help thinking of the quote from A Christmas Carol that I mentioned when I first learned of his passing, that life is made up of greetings and partings. That is the way of it. I'm sure we will never forget, Simon, all this first parting there was among us. Podders, assemble. We will never forget, Simon. This is for Simon. This is uh, Ambassador Paul Hyde of the Yellow Art speaking. Uh, very sad to hear the sad passing of Simon, our very own punking. He will be greatly missed by everybody. Um, Saturday night won't be the same without him. He'll be greatly missed. May you rest in peace. All the best. Cheers, Simon. Bye. Hi everyone, uh, Squiddy here, or Mrs Squid Tracy as I'm known on the Zoom. Um, this is just my little uh, tribute to Simon. Um, like everyone, I was very sad to hear of his untimely passing and I will miss him on the Zooms. I'll miss him with his uh, dry sense of humour and uh, the videos that he always used to put together, um, which always made me smile no matter what. Um, I have a lovely piece of fan art from him where he spliced my face um, or superimposed it over uh, Penelope's face. It was a, a screenshot of Penelope and Gordon and I thought it was the piece of fan art that I'd been waiting my whole life for and well let's just say I don't look my best <laughs> but it was very kind of him to do and it made me laugh and I will always keep it as a reminder of him and his amazing sense of humour. Hey up Punking, it's Luna or Luna the Battery Boy, or Mistress Luna, or Luna Janeway, or Luna Johansson, or one of my multiple guises that you put so beautifully in your face apps. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. Thank you for all the laughs, everything you've done for us. And yeah, lots of love. Bye. Hi all. Paying my respects to Simon the Pun King, who passed away recently. His puns and face swapping videos will be sorely missed. May he rest in peace. Steve. This is Doug remembering Simon Allen, who sadly passed away recently. A much-valued podster on, a regular contributor to the Podder's Arms quiz nights, funny, witty, entertaining, and most importantly, our friend. It was our pleasure to have known you, Simon. We will miss you. A quick message uh, for Simon. Yeah, he seemed a really nice guy. And uh, once I knew he was introduced as the Pun King, I was really surprised. And I finally knew he put a name to the face. Seemed like a really, really lovely guy. Very welcoming. And I'm definitely going to miss him, even though I've been in the podders for a short time. But I'm definitely going to miss him. Isabel Sosi here. I didn't know Simon as much as some of the other posturons, but I was really sad to hear about his passing. His puns were a constant source of entertainment in the group, and we all have to admit that even if we have rolled our eyes at them many times, we've also laughed at least once because of them, and he brought joy to the group in his own special way. He will be missed by all. Hello all, Simpsons Clips 24 here. In the time that I knew Simon, I knew him to be not only a very eccentric and funny individual, but also a gentleman in every sense of the word. I hope you rest well, Simon. Hello, it's Becca here with a quick message in tribute to one of the greatest podsterons, Simon Allen, who has sadly left us. Simon was a regular contributor to the podcast through his emails and posts, often with witty puns and jokes, earning him the nickname The Pun King. He was a font of all knowledge when it came to all things Jerry Anderson, classic ITC shows, Marvel, music and 
much more besides. At the Podders Arms, we shall miss the hilarious face swapping videos, quiz rounds, and insightful reviews on episode club and film nights. I can't believe you're gone. Rest in peace, Simon. You'll be much missed. To Simon, our pump king, he always found a way to make us laugh. Whether it was with a funny photo or a hilarious video, he always kept us, kept all the jokes coming. And let's not forget, he did the best, the best Marina impression ever, that no one will ever forget. Rest in peace, Simon, our king of puns. Hello, lovely podders. It's Tony here. Just a few words from me on hearing about the very untimely loss of our podders family member, dear Simon Allen. He has left a giant hole in more ways than one at the podders' arms. I will miss his encyclopedic knowledge of anything TV, film and music related. His razor sharp quick wit. His lovely puns. Let's say dressing up most Saturdays as a certain black widow. But probably most of all were our very special Podders After Dark sessions. On a Saturday night, unique topics and discussions with my other fellow Podders that sometimes went into the very early hours. Finally, here's a quick word from Simon himself. What do you mean they're still going? I thought they finished ages ago. Thanks again for all the work you do and the support of people in this podcast group. It's really being the help. So thanks for the lovely um, situation that you have created. Thanks. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment Production.